Hello everyone, my name is Jordan, and this is something new that I'll be doing. This is a collection of moments that one of my D&D characters, Finnegan, had encountered during her journey with her adventuring party, known as the Night Shift. Now, for the record, Finnegan's no longer with the party. She's not dead, mind you, but her own personal morals didn't align with those of her party, so she decided to be best to just kind of fuck off and follow her own path. I'll also be bringing up several other party members that are not with the Night Shift anymore, as well as the current lineup. The past members include Amani, a blind furball cleric who uses a guide bird named Magini to get around, Jalen, an Air Genasi bard in the College of Glamour, and of course, Finnegan, my blue dragonborn bard, College of Valor. The current members I'll be talking about include Reggie, a halfling swashbuckler rogue slash fighter who's the chaotic evil dad of the party. Al, a Warforged Barbarian that we don't yet know is Warforged in-game, we all still think he's human. Kermit, a Kenku Arcane Trickster slash Sorcerer, who we found in one of the dungeons we were exploring and we decided to take her with us. And finally, there's Sir Adelith, a Changeling Rogue slash Warlock who's quite literally a shape-shifting serial killer. I'm going to try and go in chronological order for these events, but if something's out of place, then I don't want to fix it. In the very first session... Finnegan had been separated from Jolene when he left to go chase after a thief who had stolen something from him. Finnegan met Amani and Al in the town square as they looked over the job listings and decided to go with them to complete their task. On one of the bridges in town, Amani had accidentally bumped into Reggie, who pushed the furbolg over onto the ground, which prompted Finnegan to shout out, Hey buddy, you can't just go around assaulting blind people for bumping into you. The group had noticed that Reggie had the same job listing in his hands and asked for him to join them. He agreed, much to Finnegan's disdain. Reggie was often irritable and rude to the party in early sessions, often threatening to gut them with his machete. Finnegan was more often than not annoyed with Reggie, and she gave him gold in exchange for silence. This didn't happen once or twice. This happened multiple times. I don't quite remember the first dungeon we were in that unlocked the rest of the story for us, But I do remember Finnegan using vicious mockery and dissonant whispers against the hobgoblins in the final chamber. It caused at least two to suffer brain hemorrhaging from the psychic damage as they died. The party had reached the first official tower-slash-dungeon they were to explore after being questioned by the townsguard. There, the rest of the party met Jalen, who was still going after the thief. Members of the night shift entered the tower, fighting their way up to the top with the help of some higher-level NPCs. At the top was a fire genie, also known as an Afridi. The Afridi went on to say that it had only recently been awoken after thousands of years of slumber within the tower. <laughs> a thousand years, you old fuck. Okay, you die first. You know what? That's fair, I respect that. The Afridi casted a wall of fire in Finnegan's direction. Both her and Jalen went down in the second round of combat, I believe, and Reggie went down soon after. Jalen had failed his first death save failing a second one immediately because he was still taking damage. Finnegan was up to one success and one fail before she was pulled out of the flames by someone, and Jalen ended up dying during the fight. Finnegan and Reggie were down for almost the entire battle, only able to make their death saves when their turn came around. So what did Reggie's player and I do in the meantime, while this fight lasted 45 minutes? Well, like normal teenagers, we drew dicks in my notebook. We rejoined the fray at the end, and when the Afridi died, it dropped a dope-ass double-bladed scimitar. In comes the thief Jalen was chasing, a red-skinned tiefling warlock. She fights with Amani over the weapon, and the two begin plummeting to their death as the tower collapses. When the group made it out of the tower, carrying a dead Jalen with them, they find the splatted remains of Amani and the tiefling woman. So naturally, Finnegan takes the double-bladed scimitars and attunes to them, because, of course, it's magical. This has become my favorite magical item in any campaign I've played, and I'll get to the reason why soon enough. The party gathers up the remains of their cleric, and the captain of the town's guard offers to travel with the party to the next city, see if they can't find other clerics to revive Amani and Jalen. Really, the travel was to go report their findings to the lawmaster, but reviving the cleric and the other bard was an added bonus. The newly revived night shift talked about their next course of action, where they heard screams and commotion in the direction of the beach and arrived to see a sea hag emerging from the water. Roll initiative. Somewhere in the battle, Amani took damage and turned herself invisible, removing herself from combat. Once the sea hag was dead, a temple of sorts rose from the water. Another dungeon! Yay! 
Imani was found playing in the sand a ways away when her invisibility wore off. When Finnegan approached, Imani showed Finnegan a smooth, sparkling blue seashell that she had found. Then Reggie did something quite disgusting, but in character. He, with the help of Alphonse, cut off the head of the sea hag and mounted it on a spike, just on the beach, for everyone, including the town's guard that had just showed up to see. The group was then persuaded to go speak with the lawmaster about the events on the beach. They met with the lawmaster Lydia, and she offered them a job to investigate the temple that had appeared. In return, she would give them the deed to the abandoned building in her district. There was another job they received from the lawmaster before all of that, involving a gang in the city. Upon arrival, Amani almost strangled one of the gang members to death. Reggie cut some fingers off of one, and Finnegan used her recently learned invisibility spell to snoop around the hideout. They found some enslaved individuals in the cellar, and they were released with the orders to not speak of this day. They were then paid by the lawmaster, and they entered the temple a few days later. The only thing I really remember about this dungeon was the party exploring what looked like a study or library, and it was just littered with traps. There were several statues in the study, and one of them had a button behind it. The entire party decided to be best to not touch the button until they ran out of options. Except Finnegan. What does Finnegan do? She reaches behind the statue, and she pushes the fucking button. The statue was a trap, though I don't remember quite what it did. Everyone was pissed at Finnegan, though, but... You know, she has a negative one in, tel in intelligence, what can you do? That's the other thing. We all had at least one stat being in the negatives because we all had shitty roles. Jalen, Finnegan, and Reggie all used intelligence as their dump stat. The party strategist and both bards were all fucking stupid. Now that I think about it, I do remember a good chunk of this dungeon now. So we emerged after escaping the statues that had come to life in this library, and we found ourselves in a grassy plain. In the distance were three different areas we could travel to. When we went to the first area, we found a small village inhabited by fish people. Imani casted tongues to communicate with them, and upon receiving very little information, we had the door shut in our faces. Imani, Reggie, and Jelen went off to explore another house in the distance, and Finnegan and Al went to check out the barn nearby. There they found a large stone sword stuck into the ground. The sword itself was made out of a dark stone, almost looking like obsidian. Alan and Finnegan both tried to remove the stone that kept it in the ground, to no avail. They eventually gave up and decided to come back later to steal the horses in the barn. They met up with Reggie and the rest of the party a, a little while later to report their findings. Everyone, excluding Jalen and Reggie at the time, met up at the lake in the center of the village where a voice spoke to Imani. She succeeded on her wisdom saving throw and shook off the effects. The voice targeted Al next. He failed his saving throw. Whatever was in the lake took control of Al and ordered him to kill his party. At this point, Reggie had started to come back to the group. Al took down Imani fairly quickly. However, he couldn't get close enough to Finnegan to deal any damage. When Reggie joined the fray, Al landed two critical hits on the rogue and took him down quickly, too. The fear was settling into Finnegan. She used her, drag her new feet Dragon Roar to force Al to make another wisdom save. He failed and was frightened of Finnegan until she attacked him. Finnegan cast an invisibility on herself and fled out of his range of movement. The NPC that had traveled with the party, a drow sorcerer or a wizard, can't remember, casted spells from a distance until Al was at zero hit points. Finnegan returned and used healing spells on her downed party members. She helped Reggie tie up Al and the group made their camp away from the lake. I don't really remember much about the rest of the dungeon, except for Jalen getting the magic weapon from it. It was a magical dagger that allowed him to cast Lightning Arrow. And Finnegan's transformations. The double-bladed scimitar, when used, allowed Finnegan to merge forms with the genie. When this happened, Finnegan grew well past her seven-foot-tall stature, receiving certain traits of an adult red dragon. She was granted fire immunity in this form, and her strength was boosted to 18, her constitution was boosted to either 22 or 24. I can't really remember, because I accidentally accidentally deleted her character on D&D Beyond. Sorry, Kyle. The scimitar also allowed her to cast Fire Shield and Fire Bolt with its charges, so she was pretty much unstoppable in this form at low levels, which is what you're seeing in the speed paint. When we stepped outside of the crumbling dungeon... 
Months had passed. Inside of the dungeon, it only felt like two days. The members of the night shift left to go to a local tavern where Finnegan and friends had treated themselves to drinks. Finnegan bought, I think, three to five steins filled with a mysterious drink called Pagan. Just one sip of Pagan was enough to make even the large dragonborn with a very high con stat tipsy. Jalen poorly played music in the tavern, and Al wandered off, leaving Finnegan, Imani, and Reggie at the table. Now, this is where the session itself ended, but not where, sh not where character shenanigans had stopped. It was like 11.30 at night when we left the DM's house, but the three of us who showed up to the session wanted to hang out some more, and we played a game what we do with our characters. Basically, we all roll a d20, and the highest number asks the lowest number a question about their character. They can tell the truth, or they can lie. We won't really know. And we played this game at Steak and Shake for almost two hours. See, Finnegan and Imani both knew Zone of Truth, and they both ended up casting it. Finnegan and Imani both succeeded in their saves. Reggie failed both times. We, weren't around, we went around telling each other certain things from our backstories, with Imani and Finnegan blatantly lying about most of what they said. It was just a mess, but it was a lot of fun. Cut to the next session. Imani had wandered off, leaving a heavily intoxicated Reggie and Finnegan at the table. The two were approached by another adventuring group who were wondering about Finnegan's double-bladed scimitar that was propped up against the booth she was in. She told them that she got it in one of the dungeons that had popped up across the kingdom. The adventuring party then showed off some of the items they had collected in the dungeons as well. The party talked about another dungeon they were heading towards to the north of the kingdom. The night shift offered for them to tag along with them as their strength in numbers. They accepted, and we now had a party of NPCs at our disposal. Before leaving town, however, Reggie, Finnegan, and Al left to go meet with the gang they'd previously scuffled with. The trio offered them a business partnership that allowed them to continue their smuggling ring under a new establishment. They led them to the abandoned building and asked for them to turn the place into a tavern. In exchange, the gang would receive a portion of the profits and were allowed to use the place for smuggling as long as no slaves were kept there. Needless to say, the gang accepted the night shift's offer. The members of the night shift left with their new band of NPCs to the town up north with the desired dungeon. And this is where everything fell apart. The first area of this dungeon was a gladiator-esque fighting ring where the party had to fight against a series of monsters, and they got stronger with each wave. With the help of Finnegan and her genie form, the party wiped out the monsters fairly quickly. They were allowed to leave, and they found themselves in a wintry forest maze. They wandered around for what seemed like hours, until they came to a clearing with a single house in the center. Half the party went to investigate the house, while the other half stayed behind in case they needed backup. They knocked on the door, and they were greeted by an old man who claimed to know nothing about being trapped in a dungeon. He allowed the party entry and offered them all tea. The group decided to come out of the house to camp outside the house as there was not enough room for the night shift and their band of NPCs to all be in the small cottage. As night grew near, Finnegan casted Leomund's tiny hut, allowing access to only the night shift. She started to get ready for the rest of the night when Amani was calling her name in the distance. Finnegan! Finnegan ran towards Amani's voice, expecting something to be wrong, but instead she found Amani hiding a small kenku behind her. Can we keep her? That's up to everyone else, Amani. Bring her to the hut. Amani and Finnegan led the small kenku into the now-cramped bubble Finnegan had made, temporarily kicking Reggie out of it. Finnegan interrogated the kenku, now dubbed as Kermit, about what she was doing here and if she had any skills that could help the party. Finnegan decided that Kermit passed her evaluation and allowed her to stay within the hut for the night. Reggie and Amani slept in the hut as well. Morning came, and everyone gathered their belongings and headed out. As Amani and Finnegan walked out of the clearing, something caught their eye. Jalen's tent was still up. They knew something was wrong. The Furwolk and the Dragonborn rushed over to the tent as fast as they could and found Jalen still inside. Dead. He had been poisoned. He was the only one to drink the old man's tea. Finnegan felt a wave of emotions, grief, guilt, anger. She was furious at herself for letting this happen. She felt like it was his she felt like it was her fault that he didn't spend the night with the party in the hut. She felt like she could have prevented this. She went to the old man's house. She broke down the door and poured her water skin full of pagan over everything inside, setting it all on fire. 
She watched the house burn, and she felt a little better inside, but the old man had disappeared, without a trace. She regrouped with Amani, who had poured a flask of oil over Jalen and his tent, lighting those on fire as well. The blue crew had lost one of their friends. They said their goodbyes and caught back up with everyone else. The two walked in complete silence as they approached their next destination, another clearing with a large pedestal in the center. Finian cast an unseen servant and sent it to go check for traps, finding nothing but a tunnel leading below, and one by one the adventurers jumped in. Finian was the last to enter the tunnel. She turned back to where they had entered the clearing, hoping, holding on to the last bit of hope that her friend would be right behind them. But there was nothing. She did a backflip into the tunnel, sticking the landing with a natural 20 in dexterity. The party explored the cave system and found huge claw marks and scratchings on the ground and walls. Finnegan instructed everyone to stay behind her as she sent her unseen servant up ahead to try and set off any potential traps. Reggie went on ahead, not listening to Finnegan, and he ended up walking directly into the lair of an adult silver dragon. Roll initiative. The dragon went first because, of course, it rolled high enough. They used its roar to frighten almost everyone, except for Reggie and one other person I don't recall. When Finnegan's turn came around, she used her own dragon roar to try and make the dragon afraid of her. And it worked. I don't think her DM was thinking at the time, but the dragon could have used one of its legendary resistances to succeed, but who am I to judge? It was fucking cool, and I'm just surprised it worked. Secretly, I think our DM wanted to see if the dragon would succeed or not, and how it would play out. Nothing too eventful happened during the dragon fight, except for Finnegan scaring the dragon and transforming into her genie form. The party ended up killing the dragon, and they all collected some scales and headed through the exit after taking another long rest. And they found themselves in another area, a town where all the months and days of the week are named after the party members. The town itself was called the Night Shift. Finnegan got some bad vibes immediately, and she said they shouldn't spend a lot of time here. Of course, Kermit, Reggie, and Imani split off to do their own shenanigans, with Reggie killing one of the shopkeeps and setting their shop on fire. Imani and Finnegan headed over to a well in the middle of town. Imani asked Finnegan if she believes in wishes coming true, and Finnegan doesn't know how to respond. She's never really thought too hard about it. Imani tossed in a coin and made a wish. The duo regroup with their party and learn about a church nearby that's home to a cult worshipping a god named Coaxius. Finnegan casts invisibility on herself before entering, and the party asks the cultists what they know about Coaxius. There's a room in the cellar that only two people can enter at a time. Reggie and Amani go first, and immediately Amani gets some bad vibes and leaves, praying to her own god. Al comes down next, and after 20 minutes out of game, him and Reggie solve the puddle, puzzle, and release Coaxius from his statue form. A fight ensues, and Coaxius transforms the battlefield into a fiery hellscape, but it doesn't affect Finnegan when she drops invisibility. She switched into her genie form and starts doing massive damage to the god. Eventually, she gets the final hit on the god, which leads to her iconic line, I KILLED GOD! Coaxius is released from the dungeon itself, and the party takes a moment to collect themselves. Coaxius' shield drops, and everyone agrees that Finnegan deserves to have it, as she did the most in the fight. They all go through the final exit that teleports them out of the dungeon. It crumbles behind them, and a wall of water crashes down on everyone, flooding the nearby camp filled with soldiers readying themselves to enter the dungeon. It's spring now, which is odd, because when they enter the dungeon, they were at the start of winter. Regardless, they are taken into custody of the soldiers, and they are questioned about the dungeon. The night shift tell them everything, and they are allowed to stay at the night in the soldiers' camp to rest. That night, Amani writes a farewell note to the party and disappears. She leaves everyone a special gift. Finnegan had received the sparkling seashell that Amani picked up on the beach during the fight with the sea hag. I still think about that, Ham. I hope you're happy with what you've done. That seashell is still sitting in my dashboard. The party awoke and found Amani's note. Everyone in the party was all really sad about Amani's departure, even Reggie. They headed back to town and spent the day recuperating. Finnegan spent her time getting drunk by herself, her only two friends now gone. She sat in her room in her tavern and began drawing a teleportation circle on the ground, 
leaving the final runes out until her team was ready to leave. They teleported back to Lawmaster Lydia's office and walked back to the Night Shift Tavern. There, Finnegan spent another night getting drunk and playing songs for patrons. She rolled a natural 19 with a total of 31 in performance. Where she wouldn't receive free drinks for co-owning the bar, she instead received free drinks from the patrons who gathered around her makeshift stage to listen to her play The Devil Went Down to Georgia on her loot. I'll talk more about Finnegan's encounter with Sir Adelith in a later video if you guys end up wanting to hear more, because this video's gone on long enough. Ultimately, Finnegan left the party after being threatened by Sir Adelith. She realized that staying with this band of murderers and thieves who openly announced they were murderers and thieves was a bad decision. She felt bad for leaving Kermit behind, but knew that if she took Kermit with her, Sir Adelith would follow. Finnegan polymorphed into her eagle form and flew north to where Monty was last seen. All in all, Finnegan leaving the party was kind of disappointing. Her character arc was left unfinished, and I really enjoyed playing her. I suppose there's always a chance she could rejoin the party in the future, but I highly doubt I'll reintroduce her, especially with what's been happening in the current sessions. But yeah, that's it. If you guys want to see more, leave a like or a comment and I'll try to do what I can. Thanks.